when I was growing up, every estate had a youth club. Uh, there was loads of boxing clubs everywhere, which was to stop kids from misbehaving, giving them something to do, giving them a sense of belonging, getting to know uh, you know, like the leaders of the community, gives them structure to, to get up in the morning and make sure they work the nuts off with it. My dad was in and out of prison when I was growing up, having an affair along the way. So my mum was having to bring up three kids with no money and things like that. Um, where I lived was like a community, so it was blacks, white, Asians, whatever. Most of my brother's friends were black. Half of my friends were black, half of my friends were white. But it was a case of, because um, everyone was in the same sort of background and had the same problems, I, uh, they looked after us. We'd go in their ass and eat food and look after us until my mum come home. And it'd be vice versa. If none of their my parents were in, they'd be in my ass, eating, drinking, getting looked after. When we was all out, there was about 30 kids that we'd all play and enjoy ourselves, have a laugh, play football, do whatever, till God knows what time of night. My mum used to call out of the window and then we'd all have to go home. Because my dad weren't there, I had to um, sometimes be, the, as I grew up older, be the sort of like the father side of stuff. We had to look after our sister while my mum's going to work. My brothers had to look after me, which he, We'd always argue, have fights and things like that. Uh, and then you grow up, started going to school. I'd have friends that couldn't fight and they'd get me into a fight because they know that, that I'd fight. I'd go, yeah, well, I'd have a fight. And I remember one day we was, uh, there was a kid on our estate and I was walking along with my mate. I was, I was just in the world of my own, minding my business. Next thing I know, my mate's grabbed hold of me and gone, won't you, Mark? So I've looked at him as if to say, like, what? And there's this other kid over here, I didn't even know who he was. He's gone, uh, you're fighting, wouldn't you? So I looked at him and went, yeah, right then. And then next thing you know, we've had a fight. I'll beat him. And it turns out he was about two, three years older than me, but I'll beat him. And then that was that. He's like, you don't have a fight. Some fights I'd win, some fights I'd lose. There was about... Twelve of us that went, and they was they was about say like a year older than me, to two years older than me, and we got on the bus, um, all the way to Fulton Heath, got off the bus, walked up to this pub, which a lot of boxing gyms used to be on, on top of pubs, um, called Corn ABC. I remember walking in, there used to always be a, a smell of booze, and everyone used to smoke at the time as well. Walked in. It was like that, but everyone didn't really look at you or anything like that because the, everybody that was in the pub was so used to kids walking through the pub to go to the next door to walk upstairs. And I think one of the kids had asked about where it was. The landlord, who was an Irish bloke, yeah, he got go upstairs. So I remember walking through back of the pub, then you walk up the stairs, and you walk up another flight of stairs to these two little doors, and then you walked in. It was only it was a very, very small boxing gym, tiny. There was one boxing ring, which was made up of four pallets, three ropes, which was in the middle. There was a little fire exit bit there. Over here, I think there was a little bit of showers and things like that. And there was three punch bags. And I remember walking in there, and you got the smell of a boxing gym as well. All the paint and that, it was like derelict, proper derelict place. All paint and that was coming off the, uh, the walls and whatever. And it was like, you can feel the, um, the damp environment or the sweaty environment. But then as you walked in, all the kid, other kids that were in there turned around straight away and start looking at you. Because used to say like, who's this lot? And like that, they look at you and that's it. You're all looking at them as they're coming in. Then the coach came over, which was a lovely fellow called John Niverson. He was a, a lovely, lovely man. I didn't have a clue about boxing though. Didn't have a clue about boxing, but he was a really nice fella. And we say, uh, told us what we had to do. And there was like the gym was full of about 20 kids, this tiny little gym. And I think we'd done a little warm up. I can't even remember what we'd done as a warm up now. But next thing you know, we was all sparring. And like on your first day in the boxing gym, there's no such thing as sparring. Like you, you, you progress, you progress and you learn how to spar, then you learn how to box. 
uh, and he made us all all sit on the outside and all in, on the benches and we're all sitting there we've got these gloves on which the gloves were like that in the old days like big pillar cases and you're both sitting there like that with these gloves on and then he'll get in the ring John and he'll go right he'll turn around and go right you and you jump in so there was no weight or sizes and that he just tell you to get in and he went to me uh, I was one of the first he went you and you like a black kid didn't know him from Adam, so I got in. Didn't realise there's an etiquette in boxing. So if you've been there a while, a bit of res be a bit respectful where he's going to take it easy with you and you'll take it easy with them. Until you half know what you're doing with each other, then you start going up levels. But I sort of went there, in there straight away. John's gone, right, where you go. So my first reaction was to hit him as hard as I could. He come forward. <laughs> hit him as hard as I could. He staggered back and I thought, God, this is easy. But then the other kids looked at me as if to say, you're going to get it now. And I got it. By the end of the round, I was in the corner like that, sort of defending myself with my leg up and whatever. And he was throwing shots at me. Anyway, he stopped it. And I got out and I thought to myself, how did he do that? And then that's how I got hooked on boxing. I remember on a Sunday morning or a Saturday night, Saturday night, about three o'clock in the morning, when I'm coming home from a club, I come home to my house, and there'd be a, a note on my door, bedroom door, Mark, there's training in the morning. So I'll get in bed, sometimes I might have an hour's sleep, have an hour's sleep, get up and go training. I was always late, run down the road. As I'm running down the road, my coach and the others would be sitting in the car, and he'd be shaking his head like that, me, and I'm like, right, get in the car. As soon as I shut the door, he always looked at me and went, boozers are fucking losers. And then we'd go training. Um, to keep me involved, he put me forward for uh, an award for young, he was like a young promising boxer. We'd have done this big thing for you. Uh, you won a trophy, a thing called the Emlyn Jones Trophy. And it was for amateur and professionals, up and coming fighters. So he put me forward for that and I won that. And it sort of made me a bit more appealing to boxing and a bit more concentration. And I turned in professional, I sort of sat and thought about it. I thought, right, if I turn pro, then that's it. Uh, if it don't work out for me, my background is I know I'm going to get banged up and usual rubbish. I've uh, become addicted to something, which I weren't because I never used to take drugs or drink, but I'd have probably gone out, earned money, and somewhere along the line I'd have got nicked and banged up and whatever. So I stopped that. In the end, I went, right, looked at my medical card, I go, could have boxed for England, could have done this. Right, I counted all my fights up. I went, right, I'll get to 100 bouts, and then that's me done. So, come from there, 100 bouts, I ended up having 102 bouts. My last one was in New York, which Mick looked after me. Come back, and I've become a coach. Now I've become a coach. I'm coming into the gym, looking after the kids, going away to shows, looking after the kids and doing whatever. You go to a kid, the kid comes into the gym, and from where you get to know kids, or you're, you're from a certain environment, you know kids from certain areas, that what they get up to or what they get up to. So they come into the gym and you'll go to them that straight away, go, where are you from? And they go, oh, I come from this area. So in your mind you're going, tick, 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 who do I know from there, who do I know from there? And you'll come out of a kid and they'll go, uh, yeah, I know him. And then as soon as they know him, straight away you go, do you do so and so or get up to this and get up to that? And you try and get them to be as honest as possible. And so because you've got to let them know where you stand straight away, where you boxing for the club, I know that you get up to this and get up to that. So you can't, it's up for me, you can't tarnish the name of the boxing club. So for you going there and doing that, then that's it, you can't do it. Like nowadays, like the kids, some youngsters are like 14 or the age of 11 are walking around with knives. They don't realise like, when they're going to stab someone, that's their life over. And someone else's life over, but um, yeah, we sort so of you explain to the kids what we've done, or that they look at you in a different way. Where um, because you're a bit of a role model, and you explain to them, oh, I've done that and done this and done whatever. As a kid, you'll go, uh, they just look at you as if to say, nah, no, you won't. But because you're in a different, I think as you get older, you realise 
realise what you have done and where it's like, man, I've, I've done a thing once where I, I must admit, I, I bumped into him into a pet, one of these kids who I had a fight with one day. I bumped into him in the petrol station like the other week and I apologised to him because I said to him, I went, I hit you in the back of the head with a hammer, which really, if I'd have done it even harder, I could have killed him and then that would be my life over. And so I see him, had a chat with him, see what he was up to and all that. And then right at the end, I said, I've got to apologise to you. And he just looked at me and laughed, went, no, nah, don't worry about it. But um, those sort of things, I've done all of that. Never stabbed someone. But yeah, I've, I've done, done a lot, lot of naughty things. Mick's known me since I started boxing, because you get to know all of, yep, that's Mark Ryder from that club. And they keep an eye on everything that's going on. And when they're at shows, they watch. Yep, you know, I could match my boy up with him and whatever, so he's got, I've got an idea who I am. Anyway, because I was making a name for myself as well, he went, yep, came down. So I come down to the lodge, started boxing for the lodge. I remember the first time I went to the lodge, didn't even know the gym existed, because I weren't bothered about boxing or whatever. Uh, I walked up there, there was two black doors. I walked up these two black doors to go training. I remember opening up the door, and it was that, the arch, the whole of the arch, two boxing rings, and it was buzzing, the gym was buzzing and all that. And I just stood there like that and thought, wow. I didn't, I didn't know boxing gyms could be like that. And to me, it's like, the lodge is a premier, you got different, it's a premier boxing gym. And I walked in like that, went down to see Mick, hello Mick, hello Mark, and all this and that, had a little chat with me and whatever. And that was it. I started training at the lodge, box for the lodge, done whatever. Um, I wish I knew it was there from the start, really. Mick, Mick didn't fuck about. So, um, uh, it goes back to that where you said to me, when your kid comes into the gym, he can work out that scenario straight away and he knew whether the kid was going to be good or bad. He might have given him a chance or he might have just gone, see you later. And that was it, there was out the door. Or, there's a boxing gym down here, go here. You was either going to do it, or you weren't going to do it. He never, he never told you if you, you done well or you done rubbish. Uh, he was, just to say, he was a good talker. He knew how to talk to people. Uh, say like me, a couple of times, I've never had an argument with him, but I might have disagreed with something he said. I'll explain to him, I go, whatever. He'll come back straight away. Planted seeds in your head, so you go away and think about it, and you go, you go, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right, we've done that. It's like, uh, when I'm saying going back to being a coach, so you're a boxer, you come in the gym, box and go home, have a shower, go home, ain't got to worry about the gym or anything like that. Being a coach, you're at the coach, then, then you're worried about the gym and what's going on. So his, his, he was teaching me how to run the gym and how much of my um, my life that I've got to give up for the boxing. So silly things like birthdays, I've missed loads of birthdays, parties and things like that. Valentine's days, when I'm supposed to be going out to my missus. Nope. I feel like Mick's still there, so silly things like um, I'll be in the gym, expecting him to walk through the door and I'll be doing something. Um, Yeah, I I got different. As I say with me, it's a different different way of doing something. He was for an argument. I'd rather have a fight, so I know I'm gonna win it, or I've got more chance of winning it. Talking, nah, that's not me. That's why I say most of the time I'm like this and whatever, and I'll go and do my, my own stuff because I can't argue. I can't argue which he could argue, he could argue and twist you in knots and whatever. But um, yeah, I couldn't get him to have a fight with me because, <laughs> cause it, yeah, I couldn't, I respected him too much. Then all of a sudden, Mick passes away. When he passes away, I'm running the gym. Ain't got a clue. Ain't got a clue where he gets the money from. Ain't got a clue about bills and paying for this and paying for that. 
and then um, and it's his contacts as well because what happens is when his contacts when Mick dies his contacts die as well so I've got to find all new contacts so I've got to do all that sit down and then gradually after about eight years later somehow I've I've half worked out I'm still trying to do the same sorts of thing but for us it's like trying to get someone it's like the gym you don't realise how much money it costs to run an amateur boxing club which is a non-profit so you get non-profit you get kids that come into the gym which ain't got no money and you look after them and do whatever uh, you get kids that come in with me I always paid my subs and I was the same as them the kids that were growing up I paid my subs I paid for all my own equipment um, when Mick wanted something I go yep I'll pay for that but um, the kids kids nowadays sort of don't really sort of do all that sort of stuff it's like people use the club as in that way as a gateway to getting somewhere else or getting a bit higher because everybody knows the place and whatever it's like even wearing wearing something like this you can go somewhere wear a lodge top Someone will look at it and go, Fitzroy Lodge, yeah, I know Fitzroy Lodge. On the van, I've got Fitzroy Lodge written on the side of the van. I'll be driving somewhere, and I had, um, you get all the old school boxers. I had one, fight, I had one fighter, a fellow called Clinton McKenzie, run, he was at a set of traffic lights, and we was about, he, he must have been about eight cars long. He's actually got out of his car, Ran up to the traffic lights, even before they turned green, tapped on the window. It went, Fitzroy Lodge. I went, yeah. He goes, he's still going all right, that. I went, yeah, he's still going well. And even that, it's just it's a bit of advertisement for the club. Let's everybody know we're still about and whatever. Because you get a lot of clubs that disappear. We've always said that no one's bigger than the boxing club. That's always been said. So say like someone like David Hay. David Abe was in the gym, boxed for the club, he was there from about the age of eight, boxed there for a, a bit as a junior, went away, got grand pains, come back. Talent, talent from day one. So then he starts, starts playing up, gets in trouble, because he's boxing for England, gets in trouble with whatever he's doing, being lazy and that. So the first people they ring up is Mick, because Mick's well, well respected and whatever. So then Mick gets hold of him, starts having a go at him, and this and that and whatever. Next thing, Mick's had enough of it all, and just throws him out of the club. That kid goes on, returns, well, nearly wins a world, world championship medal, then turns professional, becomes a two-weight world, world champion, cruiserweight and heavyweight, and he's done it. So that just goes to show no one's bigger than the club. The club will always be there, or it, hopefully it'll always be there.